All right, let's get started with this two for one video covering two structures that help to cushion and protect the central nervous system, the membranous meninges and the fluid filled ventricular system. We'll start with the meninges, which are the membranes that envelop the brain and spinal cord and help to protect them from various insults and injuries. The meninges consist of three distinct layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. You can remember that there are three layers by thinking of your brain as the gift so nice they wrapped it thrice. In between these layers are additional spaces like the subdural space and the subarachnoid space. To help you understand the structure here, let's pretend we are peeling away the layers of skin and connective tissue covering the brain, almost like peeling an onion. After making our way through the skin of the scalp and the bone of the skull, you hit the first layer of the meninges, the dura mater, which is Latin for tough mother. The dura mater is appropriately named as it is a thick and durable coating that provides a great deal of structural support to the brain. Beneath the dura mater lies the subdural space and immediately beneath that is the next layer of the meninges, the arachnoid mater. This is Latin for spider-like mother. Unlike the durable dura mater, the arachnoid mater is much thinner which makes sense as this layer is named for its resemblance to the thin, wispy strands of a spider's web. What it lacks in structural integrity, however, it makes up for through its association with the cushioning effects of cerebral spinal fluid. You will notice that the arachnoid mater is not in direct contact with the pia mater, or the final layer of the meninges. Instead, the arachnoid mater and pia mater are separated by a fluid-filled cavity known as a subarachnoid space. The cerebrospinal fluid here provides an additional layer of protection to the brain by giving it some wiggle room to bounce around. If you need any convincing of the protective properties of fluid, consider whether you would prefer to dive headfirst into concrete or into a swimming pool. Finally, we reach the innermost layer of the meninges, the pia mater, which is Latin for tender mother. The pia mater is a thin and delicate film that you can barely tell is there. It wraps the brain quite tightly, so tightly in fact that it even follows the brain down into its various folds and wrinkles, in contrast to the dura mater and arachnoid mater, which instead form a more sac-like shape. Despite being incredibly thin, the pia mater is impermeable to fluid and thereby helps to keep the cerebrospinal fluid flowing in the subarachnoid space separated from the brain itself. Like most things in the nervous system, the meninges work great until they don't. The meninges are vulnerable to bruising, bleeding, and tumors in each of the layers we have discussed. We'll go over these conditions in future videos. For now, just remember that the layers of the meninges in order from the inside to the outside can be remembered by thinking that the brain has a pad made up of the pia mater, arachnoid mater, and dura mater. Now that we've covered the meninges, we will shift our focus to the ventricular system, which is a series of interconnected holes and cavities in the brain that are filled with CSF. We've already established that CSF helps to protect the central nervous system from injury by acting as a shock absorber, but it has some other functions as well, including facilitating blood flow by decreasing the amount of fluid pressure and removing metabolic waste products from the brain. So where does the CSF come from in the first place? CSF is produced when parts of the blood are filtered out in specialized structures known as choroid plexuses, which are found throughout all the ventricles. The CSF that is produced then proceeds to circulate in a linear fashion, like a river, throughout the brain and on into the spinal cord. Like a dam on a river, a blockage in any part of the ventricular system will have predictable effects, with more fluid accumulating in the area upstream of the blockage and less in the area downstream. This will be important clinically, so let's use a mnemonic to remember the order of the ventricular system. When you think about how awesome CSF is, you might be tempted to write on social media that CSF is lit AF. Let's map each part of this acronym to the order that CSF passes through the ventricular system. We've established that CSF is created in the choroid plexuses, which gives us our C. CSF flow begins in the first and largest of the ventricles, which are known as the lateral ventricles. This gives us our L. From there, CSF then flows to the pair of interventricular foramina, for I, and then into the third ventricle, for T. It then flows through the cerebral aqueduct, giving us our A from aqueduct, and then into the fourth ventricle to complete the mnemonic with F. At this point, CSF can go one of two directions. 
It can either continue on into the spinal cord through the central canal, or it can pass into the subarachnoid space via several holes to circulate back around the outside of the brain. Once CSF passes into the subarachnoid space, it no longer travels in a linear fashion, but instead spreads out to cover the brain and spinal cord all the way down to the sacrum. On a clinical level, the ventricular system can be the source of various forms of neurologic dysfunction. If part of the ventricular system becomes obstructed, fluid can accumulate in the ventricles and put pressure on other parts of the brain, causing an enlarged head, especially in infants whose skull has not yet completely hardened. This condition is known as hydrocephaly. By applying what we have just learned about the anatomy of the ventricular system, we can locate the likely culprit. If, for example, the lateral and third ventricles are enlarged, but the fourth ventricle is shrunken, we can be fairly certain that the cerebral aqueduct is compressed. We'll try to revisit this in a future video when we talk about hydrocephalus in more detail. For now, just make sure that you know the order of the ventricular system from beginning to end. And with that, we've covered most of the basic neuroanatomy that you'll need to know. Starting in the next video, we'll start to take a more explicitly clinical focus, first by talking about the neurological exam, and then proceeding to go over various disease states. If these videos have been helpful, consider checking out my book, Memorable Neurology on Amazon. It covers a lot of the same content, along with practice questions and other helpful aids. Until next time, good luck studying.